All right, so gotta say, today's deep dive, it's a little different. We're not exactly sifting through like mountains of research. You know, this is someone's personal notes, their dog-eared copy of Meditations, Marcus Aurelius, and let me tell you, they did not hold back. It's refreshing, actually. We're not talking, you know, detach academic analysis here this person took these ancient stoic ideas wrestled with them tried to use them in their own life and uh well let's just say their enthusiasm is uh obvious let's put it that way in the margins especially okay gotta circle back to that the word they use not your typical philosophy fan huh but first things first for anyone needing a little like context who was this marcus aurelius guy oh he wasn't just some like influencer with a scroll imagine right being a roman emperor second century a.d talk about stress mm -hmm. but also being super into philosophy running an empire all responsibilities and still making time to think about like virtue duty living a good life that was marcus aurelius it's like, I don't know, being the CEO of Dot Everything, but you still meditate and journal about it. Casual. So, 10 years worth of this person's thoughts on meditations. Where do we even start? Well, they begin by sharing these really takeaways, right? Which, honestly, it's relatable, especially if you're new to meditations. They were drawn to those passages about action, carpe diem, that, you know, classic self-help energy. Uh, right, like you finish a book, you're fired up, ready to, like, conquer your inbox. Yeah. But then, you know, life. <laughs> And your roommate uses your favorite mug as like a change jar. Precisely. And that's where it gets interesting. See, as this reader kept coming back to meditations over the years, their focus thought it shifted. Yeah. They started highlighting stuff about tranquility, about doing less, not more. Like there's this one quote they underlined, if you seek tranquility, do less. It suggests a move away from that, you know, initial drive to always be doing, doing, doing towards something more balanced, maybe. What do you think prompted that shift as their life went on? Makes you wonder what they were going through, right? What made those particular words hit home? And honestly, it makes me think, how often do WE do that? Cling to that first aha from a book, but our understanding, it doesn't evolve with us. That's such a good point. This wasn't some static thing, their journey with meditations. Their understanding grew. And they started actively using specific passages in their own life, dealing with difficult roommates, career stuff, all through that stoic lens. Okay, yeah, spill it. How does ancient philosophy help with like a roommate who's allergic to dish soap? Asking for a friend, obviously. So picture this, right. readers living with these people, right? Yeah. Frustration is building. They turn to meditations and they've highlighted passages like, do not hate them and remain aloof. Not in a you know cold way, but as a way to keep your inner peace, even when surrounded by chaos. That's low key genius. The dishes can't steal your stoic chill, I dig it. But what about bigger things? Career setbacks, disappointments, we've all been there. This person found guidance there too. Facing career stuff, right, they underlined, why do I care what these people think again? It's such a good reminder. Your worth, it doesn't come from needing everyone else's approval. Have you ever felt that pressure though, to prove yourself? Oh, 100%. It's like Marcus Aurelius is, I don't know, whispering across the centuries, you got this, focus on what you can control. Hearing that even from like, an emperor from forever ago. Right. It's weirdly validating. Right, it's so easy to get caught up in that. And what I love about works like meditations is they remind you, validation yeah. has to start internally. But you know, this deep dive, it's not just about how this person used meditations in their life, but the ripple effects it had, you know, on yeah. everything. It's like that saying, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. But here it's more like, a whole faculty of teachers experiences all because of this one book exactly and they even talk about how like meditations open the door to other writers they discovered william alexander percy might never have found him otherwise now he's a favorite it's the best right when one book sends you down this rabbit hole have you had that happen oh yeah all the time best part of reading <laughs> but it's even better our reader actually credits meditations with a get this a romantic connection wait hold up okay gotta hear about the stoic love story details please so the way they tell it, they were sharing a copy of Meditations, led to deeper conversations, thinking about shared values, and boom, relationship. It really shows you, right, how powerful shared ideas can be, even for, like, sparking a connection. No kidding. Who knew ancient philosophy was a wingman? But we did call this 10 years with Marcus Aurelius for a reason. What did that actually look like? I'm guessing they weren't just, like, curled up with it on the couch every night? Not even close. Huh. This is where it gets really interesting. Our reader goes deep on like the practical side of stoic exercises, using them in daily life tools. One technique they're big on, they call it contemptuous expressions. Contemptuous expressions? Mm. That sounds a little 
intense for self-help, doesn't it? Oh, it's not about being negative or anything. More about getting clear perspective. They talk about how Marcus Aurelius would like break down these idealized things. Fancy food, expensive stuff, roasted meat. Nope, a dead animal. Expensive wine, old fermented grapes. Take away the fancy labels, you're less likely to be swayed by, you know, just wanting stuff. It's seeing things for what they are, stripped down. It's like a reality check, but in your brain. Next time I see some gadget I need, I'm picturing it like, that wires, plastic, way less tempting. It's like that line from Fight Club, you are not your khakis. <laughs> so good. What other uh, stoic practices did they mention? They talk a lot about having an inner scorecard. They credit that to Warren Buffett, actually. Yeah, so it's yeah. like focusing on what you think of your success, not needing external validations, other people's yardsticks. Think about it. How often are we letting other people decide our worth? Dude, all the time. Social media especially makes it so easy to get caught up in comparing yourself. I love that, though. Inner scorecard. So empowering. Great takeaway. Right. And he gets at that stoic core, right? Mm -hmm. You control what you can control. Your actions, your thoughts, freedom from the rest of it. And that connects to another stoic idea the reader highlights. Stuff cannot touch the soul. It's about remembering. Real peace, real freedom. It's internal, not stuff you own or what happens to you. Building that inner resilience to deal with whatever. It's so cool how they took these old ideas and made them work for their life, you know? But after a decade with this, with meditations, where did they end up? What was the final takeaway? Yeah, it really makes you think, huh, you spend years with something, a book, a philosophy, a whole way of looking at things. Does it actually change you? Big question, right? Our reader, they had this realization that like at a certain point, you got to put the book down and, you know, look, they'd spent a decade with Marcus Aurelius's words, but to actually change, they had to actually do something with them. That's the tricky part, right? Yeah. Walk the walk, all that. I know I've been there, got all the knowledge, but actually putting it into practice. Yeah. Harder than it sounds. Yeah, totally. It's tough to bridge that gap insight to action. But what I like about this whole deep dive is it shows you how it can happen. It's not about being some perfect stoic, but constantly trying to, I don't know, live by the principles that speak to you. And it seems like they found a pretty unique way to do that, to keep those ideas front and center. Remember how they mentioned having like an actual bust of Marcus Aurelius mm -hmm. on their desk? Not just the book hidden away, but this like visual reminder. Isn't that wild? It really drives home the point, making these principles real, not just something you think about once in a while. It's like a challenge to all of us. What could W.E. have? as that tangible reminder of what matters to us, you know? Doesn't have to be a Roman emperor bust, right? But maybe it's a quote on your bathroom mirror or a piece of art that speaks to you or even just some object, something meaningful that reminds you of the way you want to live. That's it. Finding what works for you, what keeps those values front of mind while you're out there dealing with life. That's what this deep dive is really asking, you know? How did WE walk that path? Knowledge into action. So how do we do it? Not just from this conversation, but from everything. How do we turn it all into a life well lived? The million dollar question. It is. And I don't know if there's one right answer, but mm -hmm. maybe it's approaching it all with that same, you know, open mind, that curiosity, that willingness to learn that a reader brought to meditations. If we can do that, mm. who knows what we'll find? What a journey, right? From f bombs scribbled in a philosophy book to like actual life lessons, even a stoic romance. This deep dive into 10 years with Marcus Aurelius just goes to show you the classics are classics for a reason. There's wisdom there you can use, argue with, grow with for years and years. Couldn't agree more. And hey, maybe this will inspire some folks listening to take their own deep dive. To everyone listening, we want to hear from you. What would your tangible reminder be? Something to think about as we wrap up. We stand tall, facing the storms We won't fall, with wisdom in our minds We find our way, just to see our hearts go never sway Break up our souls, we carry on Courageous and strong, we'll right the wrong Temperance in our choices, we keep control Forevermore No need for excess Simplicity we find 
joy in every moment, leave the rest behind I'm grateful for songs we carry Unbreakable souls we carry on Courageous and strong, we'll right the wrongs Temperance in our choices, we keep control Unbreakable souls, we're in control Facing challenges with a steady gaze Stoic wisdom lighting up our days Hey, And the soul we stand tall and true me and you Unbreakable souls we carry on Courageous and strong We'll right the wrongs Temperance in our choices We keep control Unbreakable souls We're in control Consciousness. When you have that kind of spirit Nothing can stop you Nothing What would your life be like As you look toward the future If you decided I'm not going to allow my fears to stop me. What would your life be like? What would your future be like if you decided to want that which you desire so strongly that it prepares you past your fears, that you experience the fear, as the one book says, feel the fear and do it anyway. What would your life be like? And I'm saying to you that all of us who have been entombed by fear have the capacity to resurrect ourselves. It's not easy. Can I do it? Yes. What's one of the ways to get started? Some of us need somebody to hold our hands. Sometimes we need somebody to help us out. Be willing to say, I don't know. Be willing to reach out. Be willing to get some assistance to take you to the next level. I think it was Joe Frazier who said, he says, all of us are like the blind man at some point in our lives standing on the corner waiting for somebody to lead us across. So all of us at some point in our lives need some help, need someone to reach out to us, to help us go across some treacherous waters that we couldn't navigate by ourselves. None of us do it by ourselves. All of us at some point in our lives, we need that kind of help. We need that kind of assistance because we grow from the people we have in our lives that can enrich our lives personally, professionally, spiritually, and all the dimensions of our lives. We don't grow in a vacuum. So as you look at yourself, what are the fears you have that maybe you need some help in strengthening yourself in that area as you assess your strengths and your weaknesses, as you begin to approve yourself and your passions and your dreams and your goals and the things that you want. If you decide to experience all of your true potential, as you decide to manifest all of your greatness, as you decide, wait a minute, what, what else is available to me out here if I decided to experience them? If you have to feel good about it, then you're doing the wrong thing. You just have to keep going. The feeling will pass, but you will remain. Happiness depends more on the inward disposition of mind than on outward circumstances. To bear trials with a calm mind robs misfortune of its strength and burden. Seneca Do your best and trust the process. It is difficult to make the right choice if you fear choosing wrongly. Success is neither magical nor mysterious. Success is the natural consequence of consistently applying the basic fundamentals. Jim Rohn Mindset Mind over matter is a powerful expression. Your ability to consciously control your mindset is what makes you mentally tough and ready for life's challenges. The secret to achieving this resilient state lies in taking control of your thoughts and allowing your thoughts to control your behaviors. 
not the other way around. Your ability to take control of your emotional responses and live a stoic-inspired life is the secret to success, to your happiness, and to your improved well-being. When you are able to see situations as opportunities and emotional responses as conscious choices, when you realize things don't happen to you but rather with you, your outlook completely changes. How you see your situation affects and influences how you feel about that situation. You are not merely a byproduct of your circumstances. You are a choosing being who has the ability to determine your emotional responses, which in turn shapes how you view the world, yourselves, and others. But learning to change your perspectives takes practice. Practice which will in turn help increase your self-confidence. By practicing cognitive restructuring, you can retrain your brain and create new habits that will make you the master of any situation. When choosing how you feel and react becomes your choice, you will feel more in control. Going nowhere. These clubs, these parties, all this shit ain't going nowhere. The more weird you are, is a reflection of how committed you are to focusing on your shit, molding and shaping and developing your ideas and your craft so that when it's time for you to make your rounds, you gon' gonna fly. Stop running around here trying to live up to the hype, homie. Right now you guys are sitting there and to make that first step towards greatness is the hardest step. But there is one thing harder than that, my friends. It's later in life. As you look back on your life, the windows of opportunity has closed. Your ability is no longer present. And you think back that you could have been great. Right now, you had the ability to never have that debate inside your head. That's the debate you can never win. I don't know what dream you have, but I can guarantee you that there's somebody in the hospital right now praying, begging God to have the opportunity that you have right now. Don't blow it. It is time to go from mediocre to meteoric. It is time to go from being counted out to being counted on. An hour lost today is an hour lost forever. In life, there's no time out. You can't raise your hand and stop the clock. It doesn't happen. So instead, I recommend you learn how to flip that switch when you face something that is overwhelming or challenging. You flip that switch that says, go time. You don't have forever. Stop acting like it. That's the way life is. You don't have enough time. You got to make time. God told me to tell you, don't pray no more. You don't need to pray. I gave you life. It's precious. You the one playing with it. You the one taking it for granted. You getting up late. You got an attitude. You don't feel it. I gave you breath. Fake love is mighty convincing in a world where real love is mighty rare. You can't do big things if you are distracted by small things. By performing your own duties, you attain the highest state of freedom and self-realization. Bhagavad Gita Never sell out and trust your instincts. Also, most importantly, never take loved ones for granted. Do your duty and a little more, and the future will take care of itself. Life is a dance, and we are merely the dancers. Alan Watts The rational commanding part, as it alone can stir up and turn itself, so it maketh both itself to be and everything that happeneth to appear unto itself, as it will itself. Take them with you wherever you go and learn by listening. Turn your car into a mobile classroom and listen. And then listen to the sermon on Sunday morning. Listen to the lectures. Listen to the teacher. Listen to someone who's got something good to say. 
And then number three is vitally important on personal development, and that is read all the books, all the books you can possibly read in your lifetime. Mr. Shof got me started on my library. I've got one of the better libraries. Haven't read everything in it, but I feel smarter just walking in it, my library. At least I was smart enough to buy it. Now I got to be smart enough to read it. And then, of course, I got to be smart enough to decide what's valuable and then do it. But this one is very important. Become a good reader. Some books that helped change my life. Mr. Shof recommended, of course, the Bible. And my parents made sure I was a pretty good scholar by the time I was 18. That's been so beneficial for me, drawing from those illustrations, uh, reading about those stories, people who made it and people who didn't make it and what the difference was. And then other books that helped to really change my life. One called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And then a book that helped me become financially independent by the time I was 31. And that book is called The Richest Man in Babylon by George Clayson. And I'm going to share a little bit of that book with you when I get to financial independence today, our third subject. But I started reading the books, attending the classes, uh, making sure that I got in front of people that had something good to say. And then I started keeping a journal.